Okay, so fifth period, excuse me, second period. You may fast forward through part of this because you've already seen this. Fifth period, this is about as far as we got today when we were talking about the false sense of security at Pearl Harbor. So at Pearl Harbor, there was this false sense of security because Pearl Harbor was surrounded by naturally shallow waters and extremely extensive subnets. So nobody was really worried about a submarine attack or a torpedo attack. The fundamental flaw that they made was that they believed that this would protect them. They were also, and part of that false sense of security is that they were, they had a bad sense of self in that they were more worried about sabotage, like some guy would sneak on a ship and blow up a ship. So they tied all the ships together and all the planes were parked close together so that they could be guarded and watched. And what they didn't really consider was the fact that if you put all of your ships that close together, if you put all of your planes that close together, they then become a very appealing target for an enemy that is trying to strike. So this false sense of security that America had by the geographic location of Pearl Harbor out in the middle of the Pacific was one of their fundamental flaws in their perspective. For the Americans, it is this idea that innocent lives were lost. 2,000 were killed. 1,000 were wounded in the two, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, in the two-wave attack. But really, the kicker here for the Americans is that these really weren't that innocent. Of the 2,000 that were killed and the 1,000 that wounded, almost all of them were soldiers. Soldiers are not considered innocent. You join the Navy because you want to fight. You join the Air Force because you want to fight. You join the Marines because you're planning to fight. You're not an innocent. Innocents are going to be civilians. There were It was a few, couple of dozen civilians who were killed in the attacks. The Japanese attack was very military oriented and was very focused on American uh, military targets. Um, and so what happened then, the effect of this is that forces, the, the U.S. was forced to fight a two theater war in the European and the Pacific. And the reality of that just, just is, is particularly difficult for the United States, uh, except the United States is one of the only countries in the world that could have handled that. And so this American perspective that we are innocent victims, innocent bystanders, is portrayed clearly in the video clip of Pearl Harbor, uh, which second period is going to watch right at the start of the period, and which fifth period should watch right now. So this is the clip. Mrs. Carey, you can click on that clip, and it will take you to the video that you need to go to in the actual presentation. So from the Japanese perspective, now as we look at the Japanese side of the column, you have to think about things and look at things through the Japanese eyes. Japan had very little reason to trust the United States. They really did not trust the United States, and they had good reason not to. Uh, in 1853, Japan was a closed country. The United States showed up under the command of Commodore Matthew Perry, and they forced Japan to end their isolation, which they had lived under for 300 years under threat of war. And then when they finally agreed to trade with the United States, we might made them sign a series of unequal treaties that put Japan at a very distinct disadvantage in an industrial society. Now to Japan's credit, they would later use this as motivation to then improve, go through their radical transformation and become a modern state in a very short period of time. But all of this was forced upon them by the United States back in 1853. Um, the United States in, in the Spam War had colonized the Philippines. They had taken Hawaii in 1911. They took the Philippines in 1898. So you've got all of this expansion into the Pacific. The next logical target from Japan's perspective was Japan. So they did not trust that the United States was truly going to remain neutral in this war. The United States had had a series, we talked about this at the beginning of the year, anti-Japanese immigration policies, Oriental Exclusion Acts, uh, because the Americans didn't know these Asians very well. We talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1888. 
um, in, in, at the very beginning of the year. So these things all come back now, and the culmination of all of these factors really are the causes of the Japanese preemptive strike on the United States. And the last thing that really chapped Japan's hide was the fact that the United States had been very critical of Japan after World War I. And, you know, the, the United States did not join the League of Nations where they could have talked to Japan about these gains that they made in East Asia. And understand, most of these gains came at the expense of German territories in East Asia. Now, the Japanese had taken some territory from China in World War I uh, because they saw an opportunity to expand their own colony. But the United States had been very critical with Japan and had actually encouraged Britain not to seek an alliance with Japan. So from the Japanese perspective, the United States had disrespected them, had threatened them in the past with Commodore Matthew Perry, was blustering and preparing for an invasion of Japan. Granted, it was un unfounded in its facts, but this was Japan's perspective in terms of launching a preemptive strike on the United States. And so, whoops, what's going on here? Okay, there we go. So, by the 1920s, Japan believes that the Western powers will never grant them equal status. They have withdrawn from the um, uh, League of Nations by 1925. They see how the United States treats their own minorities, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, calls Asians the yellow peril of, the, of Western civilization, and then they decide to create what they call the quote-unquote Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere to unite Asians, and as they said, Asia for Asians. Because understand, at this time, the United States, the British, the French had colonies in China, had colonies in Indochina, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, had colonies in the Philippines, and they believed that the, the, the Japanese believed that Japan was economically and militarily superior to the United States. So they believed that they could lead this greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which would benefit the Asians at the expense of Western civilization. Then in 1933, uh, the, the, Japan, the United States supported Chiang Kai-shek in China. Japan leaves the League of Nations over the Manchurian incident, which there's a whole mess of what's going on in Manchukuo, in Manchuria, in China. You got a lot of things going on here. And finally, in the 1930s, it was in 1931, actually, when it first started, that America, the British, the Chinese, put an embargo on Japan, not buying any Japanese manufactured goods, uh, in fact, in 1937, the United States placed an embargo on selling goods to Japan as well. And thus, the United States, the British, the Chinese, and the Dutch threatened Japan's very livelihood because we cut them off from natural resources. We cut them off from potential customers and clients. And so from Japan's perspective, the United States was the sole threat to their economic and geographic growth in Asia. And so from the Japanese perspective, they saw no other option but to attack the United States. So they do not believe that the United States is going to remain neutral. So if Japan is going to have a chance to win a war against the United States, who is a military superpower, they haven't really proven it yet, but everybody is aware of the potential threat of the United States. Japan does not believe that they will stay neutral. And with what we learned yesterday, America makes no intention of remaining neutral. They're already lending and leasing goods to the Allies, to the French and the British, which comes at the expense of the Japanese, because the British have colonies in Asia, in Burma, in Myanmar. The French have colonies in Southeast Asia, in Indochina. So... From Japan's perspective, the United States is clearly an ally in this, in this process. So their goal in attacking Pearl Harbor is to wipe out the U.S. Navy, cripple them so that they are unable to enter World War II, particularly in the Pacific arena. That way, if they can disable the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor, 
then the United States would focus all of their energy on Europe and Japan could set up their empire in Asia. And by the time the United States was ready to actually fight in Asia, Japan would negotiate a settlement and maintain much of the empire that they built while the United States was disabled. So this attack on Pearl Harbor, which was not a total shock to America, at least to American leaders, but it, it is a preemptive strike to disable the United States. They really did not have an intent of invading the United States, conquering the United States. The Japanese simply were trying to keep the United States from fighting in the Pacific so that they could do whatever they wanted. It almost succeeded. In two hours of fighting, they destroyed 20 naval vessels, eight enormous battleships, almost 200 airplanes. So successful, they called off their third wave. The American battle fleet was out of commission for six months. Luckily for the United States, our battleships, excuse me, our aircraft carriers survived this attack. They had been shipped out to the Pacific Ocean just days before the Japanese attack. Because on December 1st, 1941, when the attack came on December 8th, the United States forces got a new admiral who flew into Pearl Harbor, saw all of our ships tied up, and he said, get them out of here. We'll fly men out to man the ships, get those ships out of port, get them out in the ocean where they aren't going to be all bunched and ready to attack for the Japanese. So the Japanese estimated that it would take the United States somewhere between 18 and 30 months to rebuild after a successful attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese also miscalculated how quickly the United States could rebuild their navy. The United States was ready to, to attack the Japanese within six months. So this was really the thing. That was probably the, the greatest mistake that the Japanese made was in their misunderstanding of how quickly the United States could rebuild their navy. So in this, we, we hope you see that there is clearly two sides to this. There's an American perspective and a Japanese perspective. And like most areas where there are two unique, distinct perspectives, the reality is probably in the middle here between these two ideas. And that's really what we want you to be able to see in these causes of World War II. Hopefully you'll be able to get this all figured out. If you need to, I will post this on Google Classroom so you can go back and watch it and see the things that you need to see.